Welcome to the Deep Dive, brought to you by the Science for Fun Academy channel. So let's think about the last few decades for a moment. Okay. We've seen, I mean, incredible progress against diseases that really used to strike fear into communities. You know, things like polio, diphtheria, tetanus. Vaccines have clearly played a huge role in that story. Absolutely. Yeah, the historical impact is pretty undeniable when you look at the data for certain illnesses. It's quite stark. Right. Yet, if you sort of step back and look at the current childhood vaccine schedule, mm. well, for many of us, or maybe our parents, our grandparents, childhood meant maybe just a handful of shots, five, mm, perhaps. Something like that. Fast forward to today, and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, they now recommend somewhere closer to 25, maybe 30 shots by the time a child turns six. Wow, that's a that's a pretty significant jump. It is, isn't it? And it well, it naturally leads people to ask questions. <laughs> if some of these really big diseases are largely controlled, maybe even eradicated in many parts of the world, why this uh, substantial increase? Why so many more vaccines? Exactly. That's the core question a lot of the material seems to grapple with. And, you know, add to that the newer technologies that have come along, like the mRNA vaccines, the sources mention. Right. It all kind of expands the conversation, doesn't it? Around safety, necessity, maybe potential long term effects. It really does. And so our mission here in this deep dive is to explore these pre complex questions. We're going to do that by rigorously looking at the source material you shared, articles, research, summaries, reports, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're really here to understand the data and the perspectives presented in those sources, not to take sides, not to advocate, but just to clearly lay out what the material actually says. Sounds good. So maybe we should start with the basics. Based on the material, what is a vaccine actually doing inside the body? What's the fundamental science? Okay, yeah. The definition presented is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. A vaccine is a biological preparation and its job is to provide active acquired immunity to a specific infectious disease. Basically, um, it's giving your body a heads up, like a training session. A training session. I like that. And that training, it happens because the vaccine introduces something called antigens. Right. These are bits derived from a pathogen, maybe a weakened version of the virus or a killed version, or sometimes just uh, synthetic pieces that look like parts of the real threat. So the immune system sees these antigens. Exactly. It learns to recognize them, but without having to face the, you know, the full danger of the actual live disease. It's kind of like showing the body a mugshot of the bad guy so it knows who to look out for later on. That's a good analogy. And the material points out that this training can be done in a few different ways, which leads to different types of vaccines. Right. And the material highlights these different types because the technology behind them really impacts how they work and, you know, their overall profile pros and cons. Okay, so what types does it cover? Well, first you have live attenuated vaccines. Think MMR measles, mumps, rubella, or varicella, which is chickenpox. These use a live but weakened form of the virus. The potential upside noted is often, you know, longer lasting immunity. But the downside? The potential drawback mentioned is a risk for people with compromised immune systems. Even that weakened virus might cause problems for them. Got it. Then what? Then there are inactivated vaccines. These use a killed version of the pathogen. Examples given are hepatitis A and the injectable polio vaccine, or IPV. And these are generally safer? Generally safer, yes, because there's no live component. But the flip side is the immune response might not be quite as strong or last as long, so they often need uh, multiple doses or boosters. Makes sense. What else? The material also talks about subunit or conjugate vaccines. These are even more targeted. They only use specific pieces of the pathogen, like a protein or maybe a sugar molecule that's attached to a carrier protein. Example. The HPV vaccine or the HIBI vaccine for Haemophilus influenza type B. Okay. And the pros and cons there? Well, they're considered quite safe because, again, no whole pathogen involved at all. But similar to inactivated vaccines, they often need those boosters to keep protection levels up. All right. We're getting through the list. Almost there. Then you have toxoid vaccines. These are a bit different. They focus on training the immune system to fight bacterial toxins rather than the bacteria itself. Ah, like the tetanus shot. Exactly. Diphtheria and tetanus shots fall right into this category. Okay. And finally, finally, the material brings up the uh, the relatively newer frontier, mRNA vaccines, like some of the COVID-19 shots people are familiar with now. Right. How do those work again, according to the material? Well, this tech basically instructs your own body's cells to temporarily make a harmless piece of the virus, like the spike protein, for example. So your body makes the antigen itself. 
pretty much. Your immune system sees this protein piece, flags it as foreign, and mounts a response. So it learns how to fight off the actual virus later. It's uh, definitely a different mechanism compared to injecting parts of the pathogen directly. Interesting. So, okay, regardless of the specific type, live inactivated mRNA, whatever the main goal is always to trigger this immune system response. Exactly. And the material explains this activates what's called the adaptive immune system. That's the key. It involves these specialized cells, B cells and T cells, that learn to identify and target the specific antigen from the vaccine. And crucially, memory. Yes. A really crucial outcome, as the material notes, is creating memory cells. These guys stick around, acting like long-term surveillance. So if you encounter the real pathogen later... Years later, even, these memory cells quickly recognize it and kick off a very rapid, strong immune response. That's what prevents illness or makes it much, much milder. And this whole process, this adaptive response in memory, that's really fundamental to the idea of herd immunity, isn't it? It is. That's often the broader public health goal you hear about with high vaccination rates. The idea <laughs> is if enough people in a community are immune either from the vaccine or maybe from having had the disease. Then the disease can't spread easily. Right. It creates this kind of barrier. It struggles to find susceptible people, which helps protect even those who can't be vaccinated, like maybe infants or the immunocompromised. But right. the material you shared introduces a bit of a wrinkle here, doesn't it? It does pose a pretty significant question, it asks. With the current schedule having so many shots, especially for very young kids, is the focus still just on achieving herd immunity for those specific diseases? Yeah. Or is there a potential concern raised by critics in the material about the sheer volume itself? Could it risk uh, overloading an infant's immune system while it's still developing? Yeah, that concern about the volume, the number of shots, it connects directly to the historical comparison presented in the source material. Yeah. I mean, the increase is really quite striking. As we said, going from maybe five shots back in the 1960s to, well, 25 to 30 shots by age six in 2025, according to that CDC schedule reference. It's a big difference. And the material also highlights data suggesting that, you know, for some diseases, the death rates were already falling pretty dramatically before the mass vaccination campaigns even started. Due to other factors. Yeah, often attributed to things like um, better sanitation, clean water, improved nutrition, and also the arrival of antibiotics. Those were huge public health advancements. The material actually gives a specific example for measles, doesn't it? Citing CDC's own historical data. It does. It mentions that measles mortality, so deaths from measles in the U.S., was already down over 90 percent before the vaccine was introduced back in 1963. Wow. Over 90 percent beforehand. That data point certainly adds uh, some context to the discussion. It does. And this leads some scientists, according to the material we reviewed, to sort of question the current strategy, specifically the mass vaccination push for illnesses that, while unpleasant, are generally not lethal for most kids in developed countries today. Which illnesses do they mention? The material brings up examples like rotavirus, chickenpox, and also RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. The question raised is whether universal vaccination for these is truly necessary or if maybe it shifts focus or resources away from diseases that posed a more, you know, imminent, severe threat historically. There's another factor that the material brings into the discussion, too, the financial side. Ah, yes. It cites a global vaccine market report from the WHO, noting it's a huge market, over $70 billion annually. $70 billion. Yeah. And the material points out that this financial aspect, this large market, is sometimes raised as a potential factor or influence in discussions about vaccine policy and, well, the expanding schedule. Okay. So moving more directly into the area of safety concerns that are presented in the material. Right. The material outlines concerns raised by certain critics that specifically named individuals like uh, Dr. Paul Thomas and Dr. Bob Sears. And their main concern, as described. It's about the potential for the current quite dense vaccine schedule to perhaps overstimulate or maybe improperly challenge the immune systems of newborns and infants, which are still maturing. And the material references some studies that these critics point to. Yes. For instance, it cites one study, Mawson et al., from 2017, and mentions that some data in studies like these suggest potentially higher rates of autoimmune issues or neurological issues in uh, heavily vaccinated groups compared to unvaccinated groups. Okay. But it's crucial to include the other side of that, right? What does the material say about the CDC's position? Very important. The material clearly states the CDC maintains there is no confirmed causal link between vaccines and conditions like autism spectrum disorders. That's the official stance. But the debate continues. 
It does. The material acknowledges the ongoing debate and notes that data from systems like VA Ears, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and also some independent research studies are often cited by critics as suggesting a possible correlation, even if, you know, definitive causality remains unproven and is highly contested within the broader scientific community. Okay. And beyond the antigens, the actual vaccine components, the material also brings up questions about the other ingredients, the excipients. Yes, exactly. Things like aluminum adjuvants, which are added to help boost the immune response. Right. And also substances like formaldehyde or polysorbate 80 used perhaps as preservatives or stabilizers. The question raised in the material is about the safety profile of these things, especially when given in multiple doses to newborns whose detoxification systems, you know, their livers and kidneys, aren't fully developed yet. Okay. Now let's shift to the mRNA vaccines again. The material presents them as this, like, major technological breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Which they are in many ways. But it also highlights some unique concerns based on the data that's emerged since their rollout. Yes. According to the material reviewed, specific issues reported in some peer-reviewed studies and also real-world data collection, it cites publications like the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet. Okay. What issues? It mentions instances of myocarditis, that's inflammation of the heart muscle, particularly in certain age groups, also reports of irregular menstrual cycles, and just sort of general questions about potential long-term unknowns simply because the technology is so new. And there's another critical point raised in the material regarding vaccine development and safety overall. It's about liability, right? Yes, that's a big one highlighted. It notes that under a U.S. law, the 1986 National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, vaccine manufacturers have significant legal protection. They generally aren't held legally accountable in civil court for vaccine injuries. There's a separate compensation program. And the material suggests this lack of direct legal accountability could. Could potentially reduce the incentive for manufacturers to, let's say, go significantly beyond the minimum regulatory requirements when it comes to pursuing extremely rigorous long-term safety testing protocols. That's the argument presented. That point about liability seems to lead directly into another question the material raises. How long are vaccines typically tested before they're widely used? Is it really long-term testing? Well, the material states that many vaccines, and it particularly points to newer ones like the COVID-19 shots, primarily underwent testing that lasted weeks to maybe months before they received emergency use authorization or full approval. Okay. And it also points out some limitations in the testing process itself. It does. For example, it mentions that placebo-controlled double-blind trials, usually seen as the gold standard for checking safety and effectiveness. Right. Well, for vaccines, these are often limited in their scope or how long they run. Sometimes they rely on what are called surrogate endpoints, which means markers that suggest protection, like antibody levels, rather than directly measuring, say, long-term prevention of the actual disease or overall health outcomes in the participants over years. And there's a specific criticism highlighted about what vaccines are tested against. Yes. The practice of sometimes testing a new vaccine against an older existing vaccine instead of against a truly inert placebo, like a saline shot. And the concern there is... Critics argue, according to the material, that this approach can sort of muddy the safety data. It might make the new vaccine safety profile look more favorable than it perhaps would if compared against a genuine control group receiving no active vaccine component. Okay, so given all these points, the increased number, the questions about ingredients, testing duration, liability... The material also looks at an alternative approach that seems to be gaining some ground. That's the idea of spaced out or delayed vaccine scheduling. Right. Tell us about that. Well, the material notes that a number of doctors, and it mentions particularly those in integrative medicine, are now advocating for this. They suggest spacing out the recommended shots. And the rationale behind that? The rationale presented is basically to give an infant's immune system more time to mature between exposures to the antigens and also the other vaccine components, like the adjuvants. But the official recommendation hasn't changed. No. The material cites the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, as still recommending adherence to the full CDC schedule. That remains the standard guidance. But these alternative schedules are becoming more common in practice. The material indicates they are becoming more widely used by some physicians and presumably chosen by some parents seeking those physicians out. And is there any research mentioned regarding the outcomes of these delayed schedules? Yes. The material does mention that some research is starting to emerge. It notes that some studies are beginning to show potentially a lower incidence of certain chronic illnesses in children who have 
followed these delayed vaccination schedules? Lower incidence of chronic illness. That's what some initial studies suggest. However, the material is quite careful to add a qualifier. Which is... That while this might suggest a correlation, establishing direct causality, proving that the delayed schedule itself caused the lower illness rates that requires much more rigorous long-term investigation. Got it. Correlation isn't causation. Exactly. Needs more research. Okay. So let's try to pull all these different threads together from the source material. What's the sort of core picture that emerges from this deep dive? Well, on one hand, the material definitely acknowledges the, you know, the undeniable historical successes. Vaccines against really devastating diseases, polio, smallpox, tetanus, are the clear examples given where vaccination has had a massive, profoundly positive impact on public health. No question about those. No question. However, the material also strongly presents this other perspective, sort of arguing that more doesn't always necessarily mean better, especially when looking at the current rapidly expanding schedule. Right. It raises some pretty significant questions seemingly rooted in the data presented about uh, the necessity of vaccinating against every single less severe illness. It voices concerns about potential immune system effects from the cumulative load, the specific ingredients. The issues around how long testing goes on, the transparency of that testing, and the potential impact of that manufacturer liability protection we discussed. Precisely. All those points are woven together. So what about the path forward? Does the material offer any concluding thoughts on that? It does. The concluding thoughts presented in the material seem to call for a few things. One is more transparent, perhaps more robust, longer term testing. Okay. Another is potentially revisiting that issue of legal accountability for manufacturers and maybe uh, moving towards more individualized healthcare decisions when it comes to vaccination. Individualized care, meaning? <laughs> meaning trying to find a balance. Protecting vulnerable populations, absolutely, but doing so, perhaps, without potentially introducing undue risk or burden to otherwise healthy individuals through a strictly one-size-fits-all mandate. That seems to be the direction suggested. Hmm. It really leaves us, and you the listener, with a pretty crucial question to think about based on all this data and the perspectives presented in the sources. There it is. How do we effectively balance those clear, documented historical wins of vaccination against specific deadly diseases? The polios, the smallpoxes. Exactly. How do we balance that success with these complex questions being raised now? Questions fueled by the data on the sheer number of vaccines, the new technologies like mRNA, and the ongoing need for really comprehensive long-term safety research. It's definitely not a simple equation. It's a vital discussion. Absolutely. And examining the data from various sources, like we've tried to do today based on the material provided, is really essential for anyone trying to understand the full picture. Couldn't agree more. And that really is the aim of the deep dive, to take the source material you provide us, dig into it, and hopefully help you navigate the information so you can form your own informed perspective. Well said. Join us again next week on The Deep Dive, brought to you by the Science for Fun Academy channel for new and interesting content as we explore more topics from your source material.